in the first tape we talked about why we have theories of human development and this time we are going to talk about the person who is kind of seen as the father or grandfather of psychotherapy which many of you have probably heard about in other classes starting if not in high school certainly in college and on through graduate school Sigmund Freud um, the the earliest sort of beginnings of psychotherapy were started in what are called or known today as the psychodynamic theories and many times as people want to sort of categorize theories into different groups there are seen as being three main groupings then there are you know literally hundreds of different models of psychotherapy and theories out there but some of the kind of main theorists from which others have branched fall into these three categories one being the psychodynamic and Freud is the first one we'll follow here the second one being sort of called referred to as humanistic models and the third as the behavioral or cognitive behavioral theories so Psychodynamic theories are developmental models, and we're going to move there in just a minute, so hold off on that one. Humanistic theories, the main sort of focus here is looking at human growth. And when we move into the humanistic theories, which will be Carl Rogers, which will be the existential theory, Bees, which will be the Gestalt theories, and there are other theorists who are in the humanistic movement. The growth models really looked at helping people gain an understanding of who they were and helping them to truly be, sort of as the army phrase, be all that you can be. Working towards self-actualization, working towards making the most of your life and your personality, being sort of as truly you as you possibly can be. The behavioral folks came, grew out of psychological learning theory in sort of the laboratory and focused on human behavior and then later added this focus on cognition or thinking. So the cognitive, cognitive folks and the behavioral folks moved together. These models tend to be more short-term, short very focused, directed at current day actions, current day thoughts. And very much, if there's a problem, let's see what we can do about the problem to change it. Whereas the humanistic is sort of much more holistic in terms of looking at the person, as are the psychodynamic models. So with these being, this being kind of a taxonomy of different models of human behavior. Freud is grandpa or daddy, the founder of the psychodynamic movement. And Freud founded the therapy model known as psychoanalysis. As you read through the text, be sure when you're reading it to read carefully the sections on each of the individual theorists which preface each chapter, understanding a little bit about the theorists background about their personality, about their childhood, about influences on them, and about the time and place in which they were living can really give you a nice appreciation of the context in which the model was developed. So a lot of times in 2004 America, you can look at some of Freud's ideas and say, this guy was a real kook. But 2004 America is very different from 1904 Vienna, which is when Freud was kind of in his heyday. So you have to put this in a context that this was 100 years ago. Things were very different. This was the end of the Victorian era in Europe when things were very much more formal. This was an area of extreme sexual repression. I can remember reading in one book on Freud in the Victorian era that if you looked at couches, Couches at that time very much, if you've seen Victorian era furniture, have wooden legs that come down on them. And they actually put those little skirts around the wooden legs of couches because they didn't want the legs of the couch to be too exciting or titillating to people walking by. So if you can imagine that wooden legs on a Victorian couch would be seen as sexually alluring, you can really gain an appreciation for why Freud may have 
seen sexual repression as something which would drive a lot of human behavior because this was a very sexually repressive era. This was not the 19, you know, the world post 1960s. This was a long time ago in a different place in a different time. So kind of gain an appreciation for who the theorists are as you read through the different books. And that'll give you an appreciation of how they developed the model that they did and why some of the things which were important to them were important to them. That said, moving along looking at Freud and his theory. Freud's training was in physical medicine with a focus on neurology. And at the time that he was writing and working, there was a lot of what today is fairly unheard of, unseen kind of psychological phenomenon. But there were a lot of clients, patients as they were called in his day, who, particularly women, had these kind of very mysterious, seemingly physical problems in which parts of their body mysteriously didn't quite work right. So one of the disorders which people came in and which he wrote about was called glove anesthesia. And what glove anesthesia was, was that all of the sensation to your hand would disappear. So perhaps you could still move your hand, or perhaps you couldn't move your hand, but you had no sensation in your fingers. You could not feel your hand. Well, if you look neurologically, and there was, uh, neurology was sufficiently sophisticated at the time that people knew there was no neural pathway. There's no nerve ending that runs down your arm that would suddenly like stop and nerve damage would lead to your entire hand going numb. Some would run to some fingers, some to the other parts of the hand, but nothing would stop all sensation to your hand. So this just didn't make sense. There was hysterical blindness. Hysterical blindness is people who report that they can't see a thing. And yet when they would go to an ophthalmologist, the ophthalmologist could find nothing wrong with their eyeballs, nothing wrong with the occipital area of the brain, nothing wrong with the neural pathways doing the connecting. But people would claim that they couldn't see, yet if you flashed a light bulb or a flashlight in front of their eyes, their eyes, you know, irises would expand and contract it, as an eye which could see would. There were people who were hysterically paralyzed. I actually worked with a client in the 1990s who had hysterical paralysis. She could not get out of a wheelchair. She claimed she couldn't walk. And yet, this was 1992 that I was working with her. There was not a single test that they could do which would find anything physically wrong with this young lady's legs. Yet, she claimed she couldn't walk. These are hysterical neuroses, and these were things which to neurologists of Freud's day were very mysterious and not too terribly uncommon. One of the things, if you ever become really interested in tracking the history of psychopathology, is that certain diagnostic categories seem to wax and wane with time. They seem to become kind of trendy and then disappear. In Freud's day, hysterical neurosis was kind of trendy. Today, it's much more rare. I had the, the sort of, call it fortune or good luck or whatever, of working with two people with hysterical neurosis um, when I was working in New York State. And it was kind of like, wow, this is like what Freud did. And it was rather exciting in that respect because never before and never since have, have I seen clients with this. But so Freud came along and tried understanding what is it that leads these seemingly physically healthy people to have these very weird and unexplainable kinds of physical problems? And some of the people that he was working with at the time, who were also working with clients like this, had, through hypnosis and through work with them, decided that sometimes it didn't seem to be a physical origin, but it seemed like there was a psychological reason for people having these strange physical problems, such that if you could hypnotize somebody and they would go back, if someone had a glove anesthesia, perhaps you would find that there was a horrible trauma that they had been in where if they used their hands, something terrible would happen. Perhaps you could imagine a mother who had slapped her child or punched her child or beaten her child and in modern era, let's say Child Protective Services had gotten wind of this and had come and removed the child from the home. The kid had been out of the home for say, six months, the mom had gone to parenting classes, the kid came back in the home and suddenly the mom's hand went completely numb. 
Now, an analyst might explain that in that mom is terrified that the child is back home again if she hits that child with that offending hand, that she may lose custody of her child once more. So consequently, what her brain does is it shuts off all sensation to her hand to protect her from beating her child. There was a strange, weird movie um, made by the rock group The Who back in, uh, I think it was the 1970s, called Tommy. And in Tommy, a young boy witnesses a brutal murder and goes hysterically blind. So he witnesses this murder, and then I think there's a scene in which his aunt and his uncle come at him, and one of them says, you didn't see it, you didn't hear it, you didn't see it, you didn't hear it, you didn't see it, you didn't hear it, and the kid is suddenly, like, he doesn't see and he doesn't hear. And the movie is about his life and so forth and so on, and if you're familiar with the song Pinball Wizard, which is a, a big song from that movie, that's about this kid who is hysterically blind and deaf, but physically, his body works fine, but he can, his brain cannot receive those impulses because of this trauma which had happened. So those were the clients that Freud was working with. And because there had been this, some neurologists had worked with people and had found there was some psychological cause, and if people could sort of get in touch with that psychological cause, could talk about it and could work it through, instead of having it what's called repressed, then, they can be cured. So that if you were to take this little boy, Tommy, back in time, somehow, even though he couldn't see and hear, so psychotherapy would be kind of challenging, but you could have him report this horrible trauma that he saw, or have the mom talk about how terrified she is of hitting her child. These thoughts which had been repressed, which had been unconsciously stuffed down, and were no longer, people were no longer aware of them, suddenly become conscious. People are aware of them, and then it's like this great freeing of psychic energy, and people can see again, or people can feel their hand again, or people can walk again, or, or whatever it is which was hysterically paralyzed. So anyhow, kind of interesting, interesting history of, of how this all began. Freud's probably biggest contribution of, into the field of psychotherapy was this idea of unconscious forces. The notion being that a huge driving force in human behavior is unconscious. Unconscious meaning we are not aware of it and it's really hard, if not impossible, for us to become aware of it. So if this here is an iceberg and this is the ocean surface, what Freud reported is that our conscious self is just the tip of the iceberg. It's what the Titanic saw. But the Titanic thought that they were okay because they missed the tip of the iceberg. Now, everybody pretty much knows the story of the Titanic, the Titanic, the unsinkable ship sunk. Well, because it was just the tip of the iceberg, the bottom, the hull of the ship ran into the bottom of the iceberg, which is where nine tenths or eight ninths of an ice cube or iceberg lies. That's our unconscious. And right here is what's referred to as the pre or subconscious. So your conscious is what you are aware of at this moment in time. It's, you know, right now I'm aware that I'm in this classroom, that I'm talking to a video camera, that there's someone videoing me. I'm aware of what the weather looks like outside and sights and sounds and so forth I'm seeing. In my pre-conscious is if I want to shift my attention, I can remember what I had for breakfast, I can think about when I get off work, I can think about what I'm going to say in my statistics and research class at noon time today. So that information is all, I'm not, if I'm not focusing on it, it's not in my conscious, but it's right there. I can grab it pretty quickly. The unconscious is all the stuff that's gone. It's memories which have disappeared, faded, been stuffed, been repressed, things which are too painful that I don't want to look at that have been buried deep, deep down. And what Freud says is this stuff is what drives a huge number of our behaviors. Freud's theory is very much a deterministic model. Determinism is the idea that we don't have a lot of free will 
about our activities. Our activities are largely predetermined by forces outside of our conscious will. This is one of the factors as you read through the text and as we talk, as you listen to the lectures, think about where each of the theorists falls in terms of this determinism versus free will. Free will is that I have complete choice over my life. The world is my oyster. I can do whatever I want. Determinism is that outside forces have a lot of control over me. There's a lot of different avenues of determinism. Some people believe in luck or fate. Other people believe that God has a plan for each of us. And whatever choices we may make along the way, there may be some free will, but God kind of has a direction that he's planning for us to go in. Freud believed that our unconscious is hugely deterministic of the choices that we make of our behavior as we're adults. And the more that our unconscious stays unconscious, the more we act in ways that may be very perplexing to us because we're not aware of them. But it drives us. It leads us to do things. So the purpose of therapy, the purpose of doing the work in psychoanalysis was to make the unconscious conscious. Once it comes up from here to here, once the little boy Tommy is able to remember this horrible murder that he witnessed and realize that before that he could see and hear, it's in his conscious and now he's no longer got all of this energy bound up in keeping that down and so not seeing and not hearing, he can be free of that and he's freer to move in the world and make more conscious decisions and, and live a better life. So, most of Freudian analysis is how do we help people become in touch with their unconscious. And we will get there in a few minutes. Um, for now, I want to talk briefly about how people develop. Um, since much of life is unconscious, how do we develop this iceberg? How does stuff become unconscious, pre-conscious, conscious, and so forth and so on? So Freud thought that a lot of what's in our unconscious and a lot of what, what makes up who we are comes from our early childhood experiences. That our biology and what happened growing up with mom and dad and powerful influences really does have an impact on who we are today and the choices we make and the way that we conduct our lives. So he spent a lot of time focusing on the very early years. And I think just about every text in Freud covers these stages, and I'm just going to pay some brief attention to them as well. The oral phase of development begins at birth and runs for the first year, year and a half of life. In the oral stage, babies gain great knowledge of the world and pleasure through sticking things in their mouth. If any of you are parents, if any of you have young nieces and nephews or have worked in infant care, you'll notice that kids from when they're able to manipulate the world well enough with their hand, they stuff things in their mouth. My own son has lovely testimony as I watched him grow up to so many of these stages, descriptively, perhaps not analytically, but descriptively, I think Freud was really right on in many of these stages of development. Little babies stick stuff in their mouth. Freud said this is how they learn about the world, and Freud focused more on this is how babies gain their pleasure. They suck on things. Babies suck on the nipple. That's what they need to do to survive. They suck on bottles. They suck on pacifiers. On pretty much anything they can stick their hands on. So if you watch a young baby at a, at a park, at a playground, out in public, they will stuff cigarette butts in their mouth. They will stuff flowers in their mouth. And they're really perhaps a danger to themselves if a parent isn't around making sure that toxic things don't go in the mouth. But this is the stage of development. And through our oral needs, we are nurtured and we are given sustenance. So if a baby does not stick something in his or her mouth and suck, a baby will die. Babies need to suck in order to gain nutrition and that's how they grow and develop. So a child is nurtured through feeding and the feeding comes in through, through the oral stage. When kids hit somewhere around the age of two to three, this is when the anal stage of development, or sometimes one and a half. The anal stage 
of development comes about. The anal stage, according to Freud, is when kids' attention goes from their mouth to their anus. This is when the expelling and withholding of feces becomes of paramount importance to kids. And in most cultures, particularly up until modern day America, where now people find potty training is fully a year later than what it used to be. But generally speaking, this is when kids are toilet trained. And so there's what Freud talked about here is you have kids gain a sense of control, a sense of power through what they can do with their anal sphincter. And kids can choose to expel feces and kids can choose to withhold feces. And mom and dad can't do a darn thing about it. The child is in control. And if you look at early childhood development, the top years are where the word no is often learned, where kids suddenly, lovely, wonderful, easy to raise babies, will suddenly become very difficult. And the terrible twos is when kids are in this anal phase. It's when a sense of independence is formed. It's when kids learn that they have some control over their own body and they have some control over the world around them. Between the ages of about three and five, once kids have, and assumingly kids will master each of these stages and this frees them up to move along. So once the oral stage is mastered, you're able to move on to the anal phase. So if you've had your sort of sucking nurturance needs met and so forth, you move on to the anal phase. Once you've kind of mastered this, you have a kind of sense of control in your potty training, you're free to move on to the phallic stage. The phallic stage is between three and five, and this is when kids become suddenly very interested in the genital area, and they become very interested in their parents of the opposite sex. So if you've heard about the Oedipus complex, the Oedipus complex is the idea that little boys have a powerful desire to marry their mother, but then they realize, oh my goodness, if I want to marry mom, look, there's this big guy known as dad, and dad is already married to mom, and I'm jealous of dad because dad has mom's attention and dad gets to sleep in bed with mommy. What can I do about this? So, assumingly, according to Freud, little boy decides he needs to get rid of dad so that he can conquer or have mommy all to himself. And so, and supposedly for girls, it's kind of sort of the same, only in the opposite, and that's called the electric complex, where little girls want to marry um, daddy and get rid of mommy. Now, I used to think that this was a kind of nutty thing, and then I had a child. And there was one day when my little boy was somewhere between three and four, that he woke up, he got out of his bedroom, he ran into my husband in my room, he jumped on our bed, he pushed my husband off to the side of the bed. He climbed right in between us, and he looked at my husband, Brian, and he said, that's my mommy, and he started snuggling with me. Well, if that's not a lovely life experience of watching the Oedipus complex unfold in front of my very eyeballs, I don't quite know what it is. I have spoken with other mothers of little boys who certainly see that little boys really do have this very strong, cuddly attachment to mom and sometimes really do seem to want to get dad out of the picture. So, at least descriptively, this seems to, again, Freud seems to me to be fairly accurate. Now, if kids make it through this Oedipus complex and they sort of form a resolution, what happens is that they supposedly decide that they really can't marry mom, mom's already married to dad, and, well, if they can't get rid of dad, maybe the best thing to do is to become like dad. So they start identifying with dad, or little girls will identify with mom. And in this way, they sort of start to develop along gender lines, and they've sort of resolved this Oedipus complex. And out of this is supposed to grow a conscience, um, the sense of sort of right and wrong and so forth. After kids make it through the phallic phase, and they've developed a sort of good relationship with their parents in a more mature fashion, and they have this conscience working for them, they move into the latency stage. And the latency stage goes from six until about 11 or at whichever time puberty strikes. Latency is this 
lovely, quiet period where there aren't these kind of strong, sexual, powerful, desirous urges which led to all of this sort of oral behavior here, this anal behavior here, this phallic behavior here. These are very active times. From 6 to 11, kids, instead of being focused on themselves and focused on you know, their body and focused on their, their, according to Freud, sexual urges, kids are focused on the world. They're in school. They're making friends. They start looking outward. They start getting into mastery of how do I read and how do I do numbers and how quickly can I run. They start comparing themselves to other kids. and They're out in the playground and they get into sports and they learn how to ride bicycles and all this sort of stuff. And parents kind of have this, wow, parenthood isn't so hard, you know? And these early years were kind of challenging, but life is pretty good. And then suddenly, adolescence or puberty kids, which these days is earlier than, than the teenagers. The genital stage is when puberty hits, and this is sort of through the end of the puberty period into young adulthood. This is where kids now need to master not only their own personal sort of sexual urges that they had early here, but they need to learn how to connect with other people in a mature relational way. And so here is where kids, and again, descriptively, I think Freud is kind of right on target. This is where kids start looking to members, generally speaking, of the opposite sex for affection, for love, and for sexual needs. And one's ability to get through the gen genital stage successfully means that one sort of grows into adulthood a healthy functioning human being sort of able to understand oneself and able to connect with another person get one's sort of sexual drive needs met through healthy channels. Anyway, sort of a, a summary of this is that Freud believed that you kind of need to master each of the tasks of these stages chronologically as you're going through them in order to be able to move on healthfully to the next one so that if you don't get your oral needs met if mom either doesn't feed you enough or mom is always feeding you or something like that, your oral, you will be somehow stuck at the oral phase. A child who doesn't have their oral needs met will always be needy. They'll always be needing love. And so this will be the person who may grow up as an adult and be very clingy and never believe anyone loves them enough because their oral, their earliest sort of need for love, nurturance, and sustenance wasn't met. The anal stage is where you have this sense of power and control. And according to Freudian theory, if kids don't make it well through potty training, what can happen if they get fixated at the anal stage, if they get fixated in sort of the withholding of feces, that's the term anal retentive, which most of us use in sort of common language, which is kind of a, a name for people who tend to be rigid, who tend to be controlling, who tend to be somewhat obsessive compulsive in their nature, always making lists, always having to be organized in life. It's very crazy for them if they can't be detail-oriented, organized, um, and kind of have the whole world in their control. The other extreme, the anal expulsive, is the kid who, I don't know, likes to smear feces on the wall or whatever, and as an adult is just so laid back and life kind of goes on, but they're terribly disorganized. They show up late to meetings, their stuff is never in order, their hair is a mess, their car is a mess, their life is a mess, and they just can't get their acts together. The phallic stage is, as I talked about, where we start mastering and developing our superego, which is our conscience. If you don't make it through the phallic stage well, if you don't have the superego development, then you may grow up without a good conscience, which means you're sort of more towards the psychopathic or antisocial end where you prey upon other people. If you have an overly powerful superego, you can't do anything, you can't have any fun because, oh my goodness, well, maybe this would you know, violate this, this morality principle and that well, I couldn't do because it might hurt this person. And you're so overwhelmed by superego forces that you just can't move. Latency, people really don't talk about being stuck in the latency phase. And in the genital phase, this is just trouble in interpersonal relationships, which you can imagine would occur from any of these phases as well. But this is, this is you've done okay here, but you still, for some reason, have trouble connecting well in terms of intimacy with members um, of the opposite sex or potential future partners. It's believed that the earlier the sort of damage or stuckness is, the more serious a person's life problems. The, the further one makes it through okay and the later one gets stuck, if you get stuck, the lower level your problem will be and the less 
down in the unconscious, because you can imagine if you had trouble in the oral stage, that's very unconscious. It's really hard for us to remember what in the world we were doing when we were six months old or one year old. But what happened in a you know, troublesome relationship with a girlfriend or boyfriend when we were 14 or 15, if we don't remember it right away, it's probably here rather than here. It's easier to get in touch with and it's more sort of fixable. So anyway, that's kind of how this fits with this. And I'm going to end this tape and we'll do Freud 2 in a minute.